Welcome to Movies That Matter, the podcast about recent films going above and beyond the call of box office returns to boldly explore a social issue affecting people's lives. I'm Nicole Finari. And I'm Stacey Moore. And what movie are we going to overanalyze this week, Stacey? <laughs> this week, just bear with me. This week, we're going yes. to overanalyze Redoutable. <laughs> Nice. Like how I stuck you with having to pronounce all the French in this. <laughs> it's like that's that's a cross I'm willing to bear. I'll take one for the team. Uh, we, it's it's spelled, in case you want to, you know, watch this or Google it, it's spelled redoubtable. So just one second, though. It is playing in America as uh, Godard Mon Amour. Oh! They changed the title. I have no idea why. But so that's the name. If you're looking for the movie, you won't find it under... Um, redoubtable. It'll be under. Got uh, it. Okay. Okay. So this week we'll be overanalyzing the film Godard en Mon Amour. Um, and let's see. It's about uh, Jean Luc Godard, the the famous new wave filmmaker, and and his the first year of his marriage to his second wife. And here's another one, Anne Viazemsky who was 19 when she married the 36-year-old, or maybe 20. I think they met when she was 19. She was 20 when she married the 36-year-old Godard, and the film is just about the like the sort of the first tumultuous year of their marriage. Uh, what did we think? I hated this movie so much. What did you think? <laughs> I hate's a strong word. I just kind of... Um, there, there were moments that I was like, oh, that's funny. That's cute. Uh, but mostly I was kind of, I felt a little uh, annoyed the whole time. I felt like mm-hmm. it just really wasn't an important or interesting sort of personal experience. The, the, the whole lesson of the movie was shocker. Uh, tortured creative geniuses who marry 20 year olds don't make great life partners. I don't know who didn't wasn't aware that that was the case. I guess this 19 year old, maybe. <laughs> like, I, I just I didn't really care about her or her marital problems. <laughs> um, that's kind of how I felt. Okay, so this movie ostensibly was based on her book about her marriage. And she doesn't even have the last word in the movie. Like, you can't care about her. You know absolutely nothing about her. The entire movie was about him. Yeah. He has many, many scenes of him doing stuff that she's not in. She has zero scenes except for a little bit when she goes to con ahead of him. Um, The only time you see her without him, she's naked. Yep. Yep. How often, about 30% of the film, she's like lying there full shot, naked, prostrate. I, I wasn't, right. I was like, is this supposed to be ironic? Like, as he was, it was, it was directed by Michelle uh, Hazana Vicious, who also directed The Artist, or was the creative force behind The Artist, which is a pretty progressive, like g- gender wise, it's a pretty progressive film. So I wasn't sure, like, is he trying to be, is he trying to point out that Godard kind of objectified this woman? Because... That's just how it feels like, is that this film is objectifying this woman. Yeah, so um, I, I yeah, I unfortunately, like, belatedly, as I was just checking out the movie right before I went to see it, I was like, oh, no, I hated the artist. Oh, you did? (laughs) I don't know why. I hated it. I don't know why anybody liked it. Um, And I will say that this movie, so I will tell you, I am certainly not an expert on French New Wave cinema or Jean-Luc Godard. French film in general I don't like. I mean, I've seen a lot of the greats. Um, I've seen, well, I've seen um, The Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie, Mm. or Bunuel technically is Spanish. Um, So I just found he did the same thing he did in The Artist. Like, he borrowed a style of a former film generation, right? Yeah, right. Like, he did all this, like, gimmicky new wave stuff in the movie. Yeah. Like, there was even a shot d- taken directly from Breathless when they're driving between the trees, the two rows of trees. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. So I found the use of, yeah, the former styles and the, and the, I didn't understand what the title, those interstitial credit or 
title cards meant at all. They made no sense to me. And yeah, I, I couldn't I just, make anything out of them. <laughs> I just felt like he did what he did in The Artist, which is like borrow an old style and but not really make it new. I just, I and I, I think we're going to really have to, to touch on what the purpose and intent of this movie was. Mm-hmm. From un- some of the more cinematic elements, I think, like, the first note I took about this movie was a male gaze, right? Yes. I mean, she is naked a lot. Yeah. They have him naked, but there's just so much lingering camera over how beautiful she is. Oh, I know. Just, like, you know, entire, like, four straight minutes of just her from different angles, like, looking directly at the camera while naked. Her her orgasming, you know. I I felt like it was a story about her perspective. So why weren't we seeing, why were we seeing her from his perspective so much? Right. Um, She's also in profile a lot. The Hmm. camera never looks at her head on unless it's doing like one tracking shot to just be like, she's so beautiful. (laughs) But whenever she's talking to him, she's almost always in profile. And I was like, why do you always set up her shot so she's never like really front and center in the screen? You know what I mean? Hmm. And the sound editing always favored his voice over hers. Oh, interesting. To the Yeah, so you remember the scene where they're at the party and he gets really jealous because she's talking to somebody else? Her entire conversation with that guy is muted. Absolutely. And you only hear his conversation. The camera the camera moves away from him, but the microphone stays on him. So it's like his voice is the only important voice. And, and again, it was it, that kind of simulated us being Godard, seeing her from across the room. Right. Right. Like even having a conversation without Godard, we don't get to be privy. We don't get to be in her perspective. We're, we're still seeing her from his point of view on the other side of the party. Yeah. Um, it barely passed the Bechdel test. <laughs> Did it? The two women have one conversation about going to Khan, and it's somewhat about her. So oh, okay. maybe okay. it passes, but every other time they talk, the two women talk to each other. It's about him. Mm-hmm. I didn't find it funny at all. <laughs> like I just, and I don't think it's a failure of the language either. Did you find, uh, you said you were, I mean, there were a couple of amusing moments, but ostensibly this was a comedy and I was like, there's nothing funny about this. Right. There, I, the, the whole, the broken glasses gag there was a recurring mm-hmm. sort of shtick where Godard will he'll try to be a, a badass protester and rail against the machine and then inevitably he'll get knocked over and his glasses will get stepped on um and that mm-hmm. happens four times at least maybe five mm-hmm. uh which I'm almost certain was stolen from a Woody Allen movie that that exact gag happens in a Woody Allen movie as like a recurring joke, um, so I couldn't tell if that. I was... want to circle back to that. But okay, finish your point. Okay, so I couldn't tell if that was again homage or just a stolen joke. Um, not stolen. We'll just call it derived. Um, mm-hmm. The, I guess like there were just some some really really there was just a few really dry funny moments, but I didn't laugh out loud. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, like the I thought it was well performed. I thought the performances were all good. The like the argument in the car between there's like six people crammed into this tiny car and, on, a, on a road trip and they're just arguing at like the tops of their mm-hmm. voices like that was I thought really well done. Um, but gosh, yeah, there's just I, I don't know. It, it was there were cute. It was just too cute. It was like there were too many like just sort of like. Oh, yeah, I get this. It's something that, you know, a cinephile would find funny because it calls back to blah, blah, blah. But I can't see it didn't feel interesting or new enough for, I don't know, to to really make an impactful or enjoying experience. <laughs> it's it's not yeah, a terrible, I mean, it's I not a terrible like- film. It's just not super good. It's bo- It got boring. Um yeah, I mean, the, the humor was very, was, you're right, there were some, some sight gags. The humor mostly rested on the, him complaining about things that movies do while the movie was doing that thing. Mm. Like, 
one of the big set pieces was him complaining about people being nude in movies and the and how purposeless it is while you know it's sort of breaking the fourth wall like they're both nude having this conversation in a movie and i'm like this isn't as amusing as you think it is (laughs) (laughs) you know yeah but it's it's funny you said that about woody allen because somebody i read a review um and somebody pointed out for a movie that was supposed to be about jean-luc godard why was this about woody allen (laughs) it was so about woody allen (laughs) They were like, this is, he was just mostly recognizable as Woody Allen, not as Godard. And I was like, so it's funny, like, um, it, it's just funny to me that you said that because I'm like, yeah, somebody else noticed that too. And um, so I, I, so the humor was like, I'm actually aware of what I'm doing, which is telling a story about a complete and utter a hole. <laughs> Like he does not come off well. <laughs> everyone around him, and most particularly his chosen life partner. Mm-hmm. And yet, all the humor is like I'm super self aware that I'm telling the story. And yet at the same time, like she is a non entity as a character. You know almost nothing about her. Like I said, you see no scenes of her like going to class or doing things. Like he's in every shot with her. Like you mm-hmm. have no sense of what she's like as a person other than that she's beautiful. Mm-hmm. I, I don't understand the intentionality of it. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Like for a movie that's, it seems to be very intentional about the choices it was making. Why did they make this movie about a man? Yeah, it's really hard to say. I, and you know, it, it could be just going over my head. Um, but gosh, it, it feels like it almost feels like Jean-Luc Godard said something offensive to Hazana Vicious. <laughs> you know? Like maybe said something like one of his like, you know, obnoxious remarks that he was making to other people in the film. He like maybe he said something grumpy to this guy and he went and the guy said, Hey, I'm gonna make a whole movie about what a jerk you are. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. I I, so- I wonder how well, I know how different it would have been if a, if a woman had directed it. Right. You know. That's all I could think. This was the most... And then on just sort of a personal level, you're, you're either one of two women in this movie. As in, A, I think most of us have been Anna, the woman who just is in this... is in a relationship where... with a controlling and verbally abusive guy... Or B, we're the friend who is watching our friend in a relationship with a ver- like yeah. a verbally abusive or controlling guy. Like it was easy to relate to like both of the female characters. And you're mm-hmm. like, I've been both of them before, and I am so uninterested to see a movie about this. <laughs> Living it is bad enough. Like, why do I want to watch these people in a movie? Yeah, I I did definitely. I I, I found myself. I'm not. Y- I'm not trying to say I've I've never made terrible choices in you know with relationships. I I but I did find myself relating to the older friend more frequently. Mm-hmm. Where just she would get this look on her face where you go, oh, I I remember times when I've made that face where you're just like you're trying mm-hmm. to be supportive, you know. You're like I'm not I'm not going to tell you how to live your life. I'm not going to tell you what to do. But gosh, I feel really bad for you, and I wish you were not in this situation. Um, you, you can leave at any time, you know, <laughs> you can leave at any time. And she's not surprisingly the first one to call him on his stuff. You know what I mean? Like when they're in the mm-hmm. car, she's the one who's like, okay, stop. You're being a jerk. Cut it out. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he's, he's just so, un- he's also so unlikable. You're like, what are the good times they had together? It's impossible to see in this movie. Right. I, I their, their relationship does appear to be, I mean, it's, Another way, it's like Woody Allen. You know, we've seen this pretty frequently. A older man feels insecure, so he, you know, hooks up with a nearly teenage kind of doe-eyed uh, ingenue who, you know, looks at him like he's you know God, and that makes him feel better. And the you know, but you know. The spoiler alert: He's super insecure and uh, is eventually going to destroy any kind of admiration she had for him through his just like 
controlling insecure nature. Um, so I presume it was just that's what their relationship was based on was her worshiping him. Right. Right. And there's this it's funny. I, there's a scene where he's describing their relationship and how great she is. Um, and it reminded me there was this great interview with Woody Allen about Sun Yi. And somebody asked him, uh, you know, like what like what makes you happy about being with her? And his answer, it was like, went on and on like, oh, she's just gotten so much from me. She's developed so much. I've seen how much I've sparked her curiosity about the world and how she's grown and educated and developed and blah, blah, blah. And the interviewer was like, yeah, but I asked what you were getting out of this, not what you were giving her. Mm -hmm. And he like couldn't answer. (laughs) Yeah. Um, He could be completely self unaware, which is likely. Um, and, and probably so is Godard. I, th- I go ahead. No, you, I was just going to say, yeah, I think he's completely, I think he's completely self unaware. Yeah. And then there's the, I don't know. I suppose, I suppose maybe the film is just trying to point out that as progressive as this guy was purporting to be, he was actually quite backward. He was just your typical establishment, you know, white male establishment, um, you know, I'm the man, you're the woman, you're here to submit to me. Uh, he didn't, you know, he, he's, he seemed to be all about intellectualism, but he didn't want a partner who was intellectual and he could actually go, he could actually, you know, discuss any of these things with him. He just wanted a partner who would just accept whatever he said about uh, any given topic. Um, he, yeah, there was a men yeah. are talking scene. She tries yes. to like talk to him and his yes. like revolutionary, and they that both just so like are like men are talk. <laughs> yeah, but she's like she now. just walks up and she's like hi, and they look at her like, can we help you? <laughs> she's like, yeah. Well, she's like, uh, I thought this was a party. I thought I'd just come up here and say hi. But then on the other, but on the other side of that same coin, she was she wanted attention. She was pissed that she wasn't getting attention. So she's not she's not a saint, you know, and, and she does. I did find the uh, the juxtaposition with the film Joan of Arc to be really obnoxious. Unless again, unless it was being ironic, it it overlaid a conversation they were having with these shots of mm-hmm. this you know beautiful old film, this old silent film about Joan of Arc, and it basically uh, you know placing Anne as like this martyr. Um, and Godard as this, you know, persecutioner, which uh, I'm sorry, you're just dating. You're just in a bad relationship. That doesn't make you a martyr. You know what I mean? That doesn't make you a saint. It just makes you it just means that you, you're naive slash have terrible taste in dudes. <laughs> so, like, you know, I, I, it was it was a movie about two kind of just uninteresting kind of cliche archetypes that. I didn't really care about either of them. I didn't care what happened to either of them. I think you might have hit on something there. Oh, yeah. Oh, I I hope so. (laughs) um, Quite by accident. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. Now I'm thinking about it. I did notice the Joan of Arc, and I didn't know what I was supposed to make of that. But I think you're right. I think... He thinks the movie that he's telling is, look at this poor woman who has, you know, martyred herself for the greater good of of film by Mm. being with this torturous man. Got it. And so it's still, and the reason why it doesn't work at all to have that narrative is that it's still a completely male understanding of her. Uh-huh. Right? Mm-hmm. Like, a female perspective would not draw that analogy of her being this, like, noble woman suffering for the sake of art. Right. In this case. <laughs> because you're like, it's just a dude being a jerk to a woman. Like, we've seen this story before. She's neither noble. Mm-hmm. She's just an a she's just a woman like the rest of us. Like that storyline, you're right, that that not storyline, that theme just doesn't resonate at all. Yeah. They, like there was the scene at at the the beach house where 
were watching the two women eat chicken and laughing. Like for about 90 seconds, we watched them like giggle while they eat chicken. And and I felt like we were supposed to be thinking, oh, wow, look how like fun and full of life they are. And isn't it sad that Godard doesn't laugh while he's eating his chicken? I'm just like, you're not, (laughs) that doesn't make you great people. (laughs) that You giggle while you chew on chicken. Like that tells us that, oh my God, it was just, yeah, I think that was about the time that I sort of checked out. <laughs> it's just like you are not. Oh wow, you see, amazing, you interesting a lot longer people. Longer than I did. I tried. Yeah, I tried. And that scene was straight out of um, Tom Jones. Oh, is that right? The old Albert Finney movie. Yeah. So, yeah, I, 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 I don't. Yeah, I don't think a man was capable of telling this story. And I think the story he told of like here's an abusive controlling dude is a totally uninteresting one. I guess we could, I guess we could draw a parallel to La Chinoise in the sense that Godard made a movie like titled either the Chinese or the Chinese woman. And it was about Mm -hmm. five white students or one of them may be black, but it's like, there's no Chinese people. None of the protagonists are Chinese. (laughs) This is again, like, uh, supposedly progressive intellectual but really just really just reinforcing like I don't know the white perspective and the dominant perspective rather you know well and I think I mean moving into the you know the the social issue aspect of this movie like you know this this should have been an incredibly timely film mm. right this is I mean, a lot of people are starting, the chatter about Woody Allen is starting to be elevated. And there are uh, many actors and actresses who are who are catching flack for having been in his movies recently. Yeah, um, it's about time. Kate too. Winslet. That was long yeah, overdue. Long overdue. Um, Kate Winslet got called out. Um, Roman, you know, there's been all this update on Roman Pulaski getting kicked out of the Academy. Um, so, so there is the reckoning of the male, the male director, um, and his inappropriate liaisons with young women is finally, you know, is, is having Being its recognized, time's up moment. Being right. recognized, Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yes. Um, and, and the debate about, again, is, is great art an excuse for any personal problem you know like do we excuse the genius man from being a complete jerk and a and or an apps you know like a criminal um <laughs> right in roman polanski's case um because we'd we'd rather have the art like one woman suffering is worth it for what they can produce uh-huh i if it, I feel like so there's I feel like there's two scenarios here that I react differently to depending on one thing. Um, OK, but then there is the overall ethical problem as well. OK, so I feel like in many cases the art isn't that great. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like there's so many times when. That question will be raised, and I'll and the and in one in one you know case, say take your one director, I'll look at his catalog and go, he ain't that great. <laughs> you know, I don't I don't really feel like any human atrocity is even like worth even discussing whether or not that's you know the a proper payment for a proper like you know virginal sacrifice to the monster the sea monster for this crap film. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, but then, but then I remember, you know, then I go, well, wait, but even if the art is great, like that's the main question, let's, let's presume the art is great. Um, I, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think it's appropriate to, you know, sacrifice one virgin to the sea monster. And I don't think it's appropriate, like, you know, with Bill Cosby's case or Weinstein's to sacrifice 87 you know, one one is too many. It's like if it's if it's wrong, if it's wrong for you know eighty seven women, it's wrong for one woman or man or young man or old man, whoever. Um, like you know, po- uh, 
Brendan Brendan Fraser came out a while back uh, with all mm, the. I saw that, yeah. And he left the public eye for a long time because of it. He didn't even want to work because of what happened to him. Like, yeah, there was only one time for him. That's too much. You know, maybe maybe that director, I don't know, did what he did to others. It doesn't matter. Once is too much. Like, I no no movie is so great. I don't feel like that we should say it's okay. You don't have to follow laws, either uh, man made or natural. Like that's natural meaning. Just like what's what's correct for humans to treat each other. Like I, I don't think so. Uh, do you feel that there are cases where? I, I, what do you think? I think, so there was a really good um, article in The Atlantic um, kicking off about Eric Schneiderman being taken down by those women and that there was a strong sense that they should have remained silent for the greater good. Um, and then it 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 follows, um, I didn't realize this because I don't like David Foster Wallace, but apparently like he he stalked and harassed and was violent towards a woman for a long time and everybody knew and everybody was just like, look how much he loves her. It's so amazing. You know, like he was, he was. That surprises me not at all. Yes, I I agree. Um, Which is why I don't like his writing. Right. Um, But, and so they were talking about, you know, this, this issue of like, do you, is it worth it for the greater good? But also beyond that, do we almost create a culture where this is how we think genius men are supposed to act? Mm. Because we let it go in every case, it's almost like the more abusive and terrible they are, the more proof it is of their genius. Mm, I, I see what you mean. Right? Um and that acting out and acting terribly is is somehow this mark of genius because it's it's rebellious and or you know it marks them in a certain way the sort of way like being a rock star and like having a family and a nice home in the suburbs <laughs> like and not shooting heroin kind of seems like besides the point or like right? alcoholic like, writers yeah yeah so i think to the extent that, you know, you can't prove a, you know, you can't prove a negative or like absence of evidence is an evidence of absence. But to what extent are all kinds of people and women included, especially women who live sort of normal everyday lives, overlooked as genius because it doesn't fit our mm. preconceived notion of what these people are like? So how many stories or movies? Or you know, songs are being un- unwritten or 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 are un- or going unnoticed, because especially in this era of you know, you know, extreme marketing and celebrity and promotion, because you can't sell the creator, the the persona, as if as like this, she can't yeah, be a this, genius. She's a satisfied house mom. Yeah, she, yeah, you know, and without, I think you you know, if there's no larger than life narrative. Yeah, and I think what what you're saying kind of like makes me think of, you know, what think you're know, trying to talk about. What is the greater good? Like, is it for the greater good if we great we have a few of these really great books or these really great films, but we reinforce the idea that it's okay for humans to treat each other like garbage, especially if they're women. That's not for the greater good, right? That was that was for the good right. of like you know two hours of your enjoyment. That wasn't for the good of someone else who then later got abused because they live in a society where, you know, the, I guess, creative guys don't experience consequences. They, you, that's obviously, you get what I'm saying. Like, there's not enough consequences right. for people who are in states, uh, positions of authority or, or celebrity because of, because we're all going around saying, like, this is okay. Right. And and if you make the argument, but how much worse would the world be off without a Picasso? Sure, we mm-hmm. would be worse off. But who knows, by lauding Picasso, how many other amazing painters aren't in this world because this is what we decided to reward. Mm. You know, that, you know, that 
other other geniuses have never been allowed to fully explore their their art or their work because they're not the kind of people we've decided get to have that recognition. Sure, because they um, were taking up the space, the cultural space. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and I don't think we reckon with that issue enough. Um, and I think, I, I mean, I think the whole notion of the greater good is is problematic. And I and I and I would say, I mean, it's a little bit harder for me with Picasso. I'm certainly not an art historian or an art expert in any way, shape, or form. But you know, again, we, we're saying like, look at Woody Allen films, look at. Um, David Foster Wallace's writing, like that misogyny absolutely seeps in. Like it's it's ludicrous to say you can be this person, this man who's so terrible to women and it doesn't creep in. It does. Yeah. Amen. Um, Amen, Nicole. Yeah. So so you're like, OK, well, but Eric Schneiderman was like fighting for all these women. Like, yeah, how long would that have lasted? Like, I don't know. You know, I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical that the reality is you can't, you're not totally different privately than you are publicly. Right. And we could, we can, you know, think of examples outside of the creative uh, arena as well. We could, you know, talk about like politicians who were ostensibly working towards um, maybe, maybe issues for women, but then out of the office were doing terrible things to women. (laughs) That, you know, and even even you know, progressive so uh, so called progressive uh, creative guys like Louis C.K. He would mm-hmm. he would you know create these episodes that were like, oh, shouldn't we treat women better? And then in his life, going, nah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe we should be. Maybe it's maybe it's more progressive to just give women voices. Rather than say, oh, but it's a shame that we're not giving more voice to these men who are saying nice things about women. Shouldn't we just let them abuse women right. so they can keep saying nice things about women? No. Push them off. You know, bring out the big hook. Pull them off stage. Put someone else up there who's a good person and has like, because I'm sorry, like, you know, maybe maybe there is like this kind of uh, phenomenon of like, like in Big Fish, Steve Buscemi's author character is is like living in this mm-hmm. quiet happy town and he, he writes a poem that says roses are red violets are blue living in living in this town is great like but yeah maybe when you're happy and well adjusted maybe your art does suck but like we don't you know, there's got to be like, like I'm sorry it just it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't make it okay it doesn't make it worth it there's someone out there there's someone out there who is not treating humans like trash who can make a good film <laughs> can direct a film I just yeah I, that, that can't be it can't be the case that it's you know mutually exclusive I also think part of the problem may be is that this you know very messed up individual um the art that they create resonates very well with people who see that darkness in themselves mm. and that when you when you don't come from that perspective it's less legitimate and it's less and maybe fewer people respond to it i mean we had this discussion i mean again i kind of bring up fight club way too much but i really hate it like everything about that is just speaks to how like men are incapable of handling the world that's a very resonant story with a lot of dudes (laughs) like oh right and, I, and it's sort of like I, I like to think a happier, more well-adjusted dude is like, yeah, I mean, it might be fun to watch, but it doesn't really speak to me in this way, you know? I, I think at the end of the day, it's it's it goes back to privilege. Um, mm-hmm. I think I think men in many cases uh, have the privilege of of they have more room for error. Right. And what mm-hmm. that and when we glorify folks that like I do as a side note I want to say when we glorify men that do these terrible things we're completely ignoring all the wonderful wonderful men who are strong and you know and good and kind and honest like I I would like to hear more of their stories quite frankly um Mm -hmm. but uh that said I you know this this phenomenon that we've, we've been discussing 
it just it it perpetuates privilege and it could be something even as small as Chris Pratt flashing Amy Poehler on set and getting just a, a letter, just a letter from the, you know, from NBC saying, now, seriously, you shouldn't do that. Don't do it anymore. And Chris Pratt, like reading the letter on a talk show and laughing about how funny it is that they, you know, wrote him a letter telling him not to do something and how he framed it on his wall. Cause isn't that hysterical? Like it's, you know, Chris Pratt says, I'm a white guy. I do what I want. If I want to flash someone, even someone who's like, you know, higher ranking than me, more accomplished, more respected than me, it's okay because she's a petite woman and I get to flash her and I get to walk off and be my merry white male self. Like it, when you say that's okay, when you say, yeah, it's okay for Woody Allen to do what he does. It's okay for Roman Polanski to do what he does. It's okay for Eric Schneiderman to do what he does. You're perpetuating that privilege, and it's um, and that, and it's, it's just it's an atrocity against humanity, and we shouldn't do it. I, I guess I, I guess I feel more black and white about it. I don't feel as gray as, as I used to. I'm like, no, no, not okay. Yeah, I I think, I think it is pretty black and white. I mean, obviously, it's easy it's easier for us to say it's black and white than um, because we don't get to have the privilege, so it's nothing that's getting taken away from us. But I. <laughs> yeah. I do think, I think we are moving towards that world, but I think we are constantly, we, we are going to have this debate over and over and over and over and over again. Mm. We're, we, this is always going to be thrown in our face. Like, how can you tear down this great man? How can right. you tear down this great man? It, it's, it's, it'll be used as a justification on a redemption arc. Like there's just so many ways that this conversation is, is no, nowhere near over for mm. any set of women or men who come forward and say, no, yeah, I don't, you cannot be a great man or a great person and, um, and treat others like garbage. Right. And PS, this trickles down. So people will, you know, call the, the rape survivor and say the exact same thing about a guy who is a principal, a police chief, uh, mm. her dad, you know, the patriarch of the family, whoever. They're, they will, it's victim blaming. It's saying, you know, the crime was not what he did to you. It's you saying what he did out loud. And that's garbage. Good point. Good point. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, so on that note, um, do you uh, do do we just want to like won this with a social impact score and move on? I, I think it's I think it's worth going through the motions because otherwise, you know, it, a, a ten doesn't mean anything, or even a two doesn't mean anything if we don't occasionally give a one, right? So mm-hmm. uh, for a social mm-hmm. social impact score uh, on one to ten, one being it changed nothing, and ten being really once new is gone forever. I can confidently give this a, a redoutable slash Godard, Godard mon amour a an an. <laughs> it's a one. Uh, I, I'm so amazed and impressed that you're brushing up on French for this podcast. Thank you, I, Stacey. I, I doubt the French, any French people listening are as impressed as you. <laughs> Tell us something we should see, watch, read, check out. Um... Okay, uh, this is random, but I've been recently. I've been reading the uh, the Tao Te Ching, and mm. I think it's really beautiful. It's it's only you can finish it. It's it's uh, basically the kind of the primary writing of of Taoism, da- uh, spelled either T A O mm-hmm. or D A O, um, depending. And um, I've been finding it really rewarding. It takes it only takes a couple hours. It takes longer if you want to reflect on it. It's something, it goes into a lot about like what makes a good leader. A leader is a good leader mm-hmm. is someone who like actually cares about the people in their constituency. Uh, it's something that our leaders could really benefit from. And um, I don't know, it's worth checking out the Tao Te Ching. Cool. So this kind of came up last minute uh, yesterday. I am going to recommend a great periodical that everybody should purchase where it is available for you. And it is called Street Sense. 
Aww. If your local homeless people participate in Street Sense, all them, all the homeless people you see hawking papers, it is a wonderful organization. It often has interesting stories in it. It is there for homeless people who are trying to get off the streets and trying to improve their lives. If you are ever s- sort of concerned that, oh, this money is just going to go to like feed their addiction or whatever, um, you know, however you feel about the homeless. If you are somewhat reluctant to support the homeless, but also feel for their plight, um, buy yourself a street sense the next time you see a vendor. Uh, you're doing a, a positive thing for the world. Cheers to that. We hope you enjoy this episode of Movies That Matter. If you did, please take a second to leave a review on iTunes and recommend it to your friends. Check out our website at moviesthatmatterpodcast.com for links to things we've discussed and to visit our store. And if you want to talk to us, leave a comment on our Facebook page or on Twitter with our tag at Movies Matter Pod. And remember, and remember, movies matter. And so do you. We'll see you next time. Welcome to Film Roast. Hey everyone, Hannah here, the co-host of Film Roast, where two over-caffeinated and underqualified friends talk about all things movies. If you like film factoids, lots of sarcasm, and bad impressions, check us out on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. You can also follow us on Twitter, at Film Roast Show, and like us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Film Roast. Happy roasting!